you know those heartwarming pet videos everyone loves online? Like we all love them, right? Definitely. But um, you know what you don't see? Like the the behind the scenes stuff. Right. It's this hidden tension brewing in like veterinary medicine itself. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we're diving into today yeah, yeah. with uh, a series of Substack posts. Okay by a Dr. Jose Fanique. And he, he really, he doesn't mince words. He's He's got some really strong opinions about the challenges facing vets today. Yeah, he, he's got some strong opinions. And I think it's because he's been on the front lines. Totally. And, and, yeah. and he's seeing this firsthand. Totally. Yeah. So we're going to buckle up because we're about to explore what happens when, you know, like the bottom line of a business clashes with actual, like, real compassion for animal care. Yeah. And trust me, it gets pretty thought provoking. <laughs> I believe it. You ever have you ever felt rushed during a vet appointment? Oh yeah. We're going to uncover why that even happens, mm. what kind of impact it has on mm. on you, your pet, everybody involved really. Absolutely. At the at the very heart of this whole issue, this tension that's going on is corporations just wanting to maximize profits and then you have veterinarians who are driven by their love for animals. Right. And it's it's a clash that Dr. Fanique calls care versus commerce. Care versus commerce. That's like such a it's almost like a pithy way of putting it. It really is. But it, it really it really kind of sums it up, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, because it's like these two forces are constantly like butting heads. Holy yeah. And it's not just like some abstract concept. It's like it manifests itself in very real ways. And so, for example, Dr. Finick talks about how there's pressure put on vets. They have to push services, things that maybe aren't completely necessary. Oh, wow. But it's all to boost these profits. So wait, so you're telling me there's like potentially unnecessary procedures that are being done just to like meet some kind of quota? That's that's what he's highlighting. Wow. And that's where things get kind of ethically murky, I think. For sure. Because it's like if you feel like your vet is recommending a procedure just for financial reasons, you lose trust. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that trust needs to be there. Like you need to know that your vet is advocating for what's best for your pet. Yeah. Not for for someone's pockets to be lined, you know? Totally. Yeah. You start to wonder, like, is my pet a patient or are they just a walking, like, revenue stream? Yeah. Which is not a good feeling. And it's so funny because, you know, this next point Dr. Samike makes about this, this term he uses, <laughs> this Starbucks manager in veterinary hospitals. Yeah. I was like... What? Yeah, it's a it's a very striking analogy that he uses. It is. It's jarring a little bit. Yeah. Because we're talking about living beings here. Exactly. Not like, I don't know, picking up a latte on the way to work, right? Right, right. So explain this, like break this down for me a little bit, this whole Starbucks manager thing. What's what's the deal with that? So he's essentially arguing that, you know, a lot of these corporations are trying to I guess, mirror a corporate structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're appointing managers who have little to no experience in veterinary medicine. So you're saying, so somebody could be managing a, you know, a coffee shop and then all of a sudden they're, they're calling the shots at a place where, you know, lives are on the line, basically. That's, in some cases, that's what's happening. Oh, wow. And this approach obviously has its dangers, right? Yeah. Because you're coming in and you're just laser focused on how can we be more efficient and how can we make more profit? And like on the surface, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Right. Of course. Yeah. Well, but like you said, veterinary medicine is so much more than just ticking boxes. Totally. It's it's such it's about individual animals and every animal is different, just like every person. Yeah. And, and you know, because of this disconnect, you have crucial details being overlooked. Mm -hmm. And as he puts it, you can't treat a vet clinic like you treat, you know, like a fast food restaurant. Right. Like you can't just do the same thing for everybody. It's just it's just not how it works. It's way more nuanced than that. Yeah, totally. It sounds like I mean, that just sounds like a recipe for disaster, really. Yeah. For the animals, for the vets themselves. And speaking of the vets, this brings us to this this whole concept of moral injury, which I always thought was something that like, you know, combat veterans experience. I never really put it with veterinary medicine before. It is often used in that context. Right. But Dr. Fenecker Lodge draws this really powerful parallel. Okay. That vets, especially those working within these corporate structures, are experiencing moral injury. I'm, I'm very curious about this. Because, I, you know, like I said, I always associated that term with something else completely different. Mm -hmm. So how does moral injury even, like, how does that manifest itself in this world? So essentially, it's it's when you're put in a position where you're forced to act in a way that violates your own moral code. Mm -hmm. And for these vets, oftentimes that looks like, you know, they're being pressured to put profits over the well-being of the patient. 
So it's like you're constantly choosing between what your boss is telling you to do mm -hmm. and what you, as somebody who has all this training and experience, you know what's the right thing to do. Right. And it's it's a really hard position to be in. And, yeah. he, and he makes a really good point in saying that, like, this isn't just burnout. Right. Burnout is a huge problem in the field. But moral injury goes so much deeper than that. It's it's almost like a trauma. Yeah. yeah. Like it's it's this deep seated trauma that stems from feeling like you have betrayed your oath to do no harm. And then also think about it from the pet owner's perspective, too. Yeah, it makes you kind of, you know, even if you think your vet might be giving you all the right information, there's that little seed of doubt. Right. Like, wait a minute, are you are you upselling me here? Like, what's what's going on? And it just erodes the relationship. Totally. You start to question everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you wonder if you're getting the whole story or if, you know, again, if you're just a walking wallet. Right. And that's, I mean, that's not what you want to be thinking about when you're just trying to get your, your pet some help, you know? Right, exactly. And it sounds like this is just, like, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the challenges that that Dr. Finique is is highlighting. You're right. And one of the things that, that I thought was really interesting that he points out is that these pressures don't affect every veterinarian the same way. Okay. And he goes into this whole thing about how corporate veterinary structures can be particularly challenging for neurodiverse individuals. Oh, wow. I never thought about that before. Yeah. How does neurodiversity play into all of this? Well, he observes that a high number of neurodiverse individuals are actually drawn to veterinary medicine. Really? Yeah. Now, that makes me wonder, like, how does that mesh with this corporate structure that we've been talking about? Is there a conflict there? You're absolutely right. There can be. There can be. See, a lot of neurodiverse vets, they really thrive in environments where they can, like, really focus, you know? Yeah. Like, they have their own way of problem solving, and... And they need a certain amount of autonomy. Which, from what you're saying, sounds like the opposite of what this whole corporate model is. Yeah, it, it can be, unfortunately, right. because they're all about speed, efficiency. Right. And, you know, you're you're expected to see a certain number of patients per day. Right. And for some, that can be really challenging. I bet. So you're kind of forcing people to operate outside of their, their comfort zone, which can't be good for, for them. But it also, like you were saying, affects the quality of care, I'm assuming. Exactly. And that's what's so important for people to realize. It's not just about the vets themselves, but like, are they able to give the best possible care if they're if they're put in these situations? And this actually goes into another thing that Dr. Finnick talks about, which is micromanagement. Ugh, micromanagement. Yeah, that's like the worst. It's like everywhere. Right. Yeah. But I can see why it'd be especially hard in in vet med. Yeah, because you're talking about people who've dedicated years and years to learning this very specific skill. Exactly. They should be able to use their expertise. Right. You know, they shouldn't have someone looking over their shoulder constantly. Right. But that's what's happening. And he talks about how, you know, you have these managers who weren't vets. Mm -hmm. And they're coming in and, and imposing all these rules. Yeah, so it's almost like disrespectful in a way exactly like you're telling you know a concert pianist how to play the piano right exactly like just it just doesn't make sense you've hired them to do a job let them do it exactly and it can be really disheartening he says when the micromanagement comes from someone who doesn't even know like really what vet care is all about oh i bet like you know it's one thing to get directions it's another thing if the directions are just like totally off right right like clueless yeah exactly so it's no wonder these vets are like, I don't know, disillusioned and burnt out. Oh, yeah. It just sounds very demoralizing. Yeah. And it's not just the vets, right? It's it's your pets. Right, because we're the ones taking them there. Exactly. Yeah. And and Dr. Fneek points out that often this whole corporate push for bigger profits, it trickles down into what they call upselling, which is basically like... Recommending stuff you don't need. Yeah, like, oh, your dog needs this. And it's like, do they really, though? Yeah, is this really necessary or are you just trying to, like, meet some quota? Right, exactly. And it goes back to that trust thing. Totally. And mm. he even gives a specific example of, like, unnecessary dental cleanings. Really? Yeah. And, I mean, listen, dental care is very important. Right, of course. But, like, you shouldn't be doing it just to, you know, make more money. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it sounds like it just comes down to being transparent, you know? Yeah. Like, pet owners should feel... Like they can ask questions, yeah. you know, and get honest answers exactly, and not feel pressured. So if we like zoom out a little bit and look at this whole corporate model, yeah. is there any hope for it? Like, can it be saved or is it just inherently flawed? 
he he makes it clear that he doesn't think it's like working right now yep. in its current form he doesn't think it works with what veterinary medicine really is so what what do you mean by that what's at the heart of that well he believes that like at its core that med is all about compassion for animals okay you want to help them right it's it's rooted in science it's rooted in ethics right and respecting animals and this current corporate model he says it just clashes with those values so you're trying to put like a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. It's just not working. Exactly. So so what's the solution then? Well, he says we need like a huge shift in how we see things. Okay. We shouldn't look at vet hospitals as just another business opportunity. Right. Yeah. We need to prioritize the well-being of the animals and the people who care for them. So put care back at the center. But wouldn't that like, I mean, wouldn't that affect profits though? That's what a lot of people think. But he'd argue, like, no, there's a really strong case to be made that ethical care, you know, focusing on the patient, is good for business. Really? That's really interesting. Tell me more about that. So think about it. When vets feel good, when they feel respected, they're not going to burn out as easily. Right. And they'll probably stay at their jobs longer. Which means less turnover, which means saving money in the long run. Exactly. It's more sustainable. Right. And then when a client, like you or me, you know, when we go to the vet and we feel like, okay, my vet can tell me what's best for my pet and they don't feel this pressure from like the higher ups. Yeah. That builds trust. Absolutely. And trust leads to loyalty. Of course. Yeah. And loyalty in the long run means, you know, a healthier bottom line. So it's not either or. It's not like you can't have ethical practices and be profitable. Exactly. It's about playing the long game. Right. You're investing in the well-being of everyone, the animals and the professionals, and everyone wins. It's like this whole other way of of thinking about how this could work. This is this is really eye opening. But what like what concrete changes like what's he actually suggesting? How do we even begin to do this? Well, he says, like, first of all, vets need more autonomy. OK, like let them, you know, structure their day how they want. Right. Manage their patients how they see fit. OK. Interact with clients how they want. Give them back some control. So they don't feel so like stifled. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, he feels really strongly about leadership roles should be filled by people who actually get it. Like people who've been there, who understand the job. Right. And who are going to put the animals first. So not just someone with like an MBA who's like, you know. Right. Exactly. Like they need to understand what it's really like to be a vet. Right. But I mean, how realistic is that? Good question. Like are these corporations really going to you know, go for that. Well, he's not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. Okay. But he's like, we got to start talking about it. People need to be aware of these issues. Oh, wow. And and he's actually optimistic. He thinks things can change. Okay. That we can have a different kind of veterinary practice, one that really does put ethical care first. Okay. Supports its vets, you know, and makes clients feel like they can trust them. Right. That's huge. Yeah. It's about remembering why people become vets in the first place, you yeah. know? Because they love animals. Yeah. They want to help them. Yeah. And when you have a good work environment, that makes it easier to do that, you know? Totally. Wow. This is this is really eye-opening. I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah. It's it's really interesting stuff. And I bet a lot of people listening are like, wow, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most important things about what he's doing. He's starting this conversation. Exactly. It's right? like, we don't really hear about this side of things. Right. And he's not afraid to say like, hey, this isn't right. He's he's giving a voice to people. Exactly. But he's also like it's not just complaining. Right. He's saying, like, here are solutions. He is. He is. And and, you know, some things might take a while, mm -hmm. but there are things that pet owners can do right now. Oh, yeah, that's right. I almost forgot. What can we do? We have to be smart. OK. Do your research. OK. Don't be afraid to ask your vet like, hey, what's your philosophy here? How do you do things? So we should be asking tough questions. Yeah. Not just like, you know. Exactly. Taking our pet in and being like, OK, whatever you say. Right. And then support the places that you feel good about. Right. Choose carefully where you spend your money. Exactly. Yeah. Put your money where your mouth is. I love that. And, and those choices, they matter. They do, yeah. They can really make a difference. It's about sending a message almost. It is. Like, we want something different. Yeah. We want ethical care. We want what's best for our pets. Exactly. And for the people who care for them. Yes. On that note, I think we should we should end it there. I agree. This has been, this has been awesome. It has. Thank you. Thank you.